So we are in Matthew chapter 6, 25, even though I had 19 on the screen. And I recommended to everybody that they go back because it's been a while since we've done the Wednesday night, um, just the way things have gone. And uh, so just to listen to chapters 5 and 6, hopefully you were able to do that. If you didn't, I recommend you going ahead and doing it after we're done here anyway. Because uh, it's always good to keep the context, to keep the perspective of the, the, the bigger picture, because this is all one sermon on the mount. It's not the sermons on the mount. It is the sermon on the mount. And it all hangs together and it all revolves around the theme of how do we live and walk in the righteousness Christ has given us. And that's kind of a fancy way of saying, how do we live our faith? Because everything's changed. You know, when we talk about living, <clears throat> pardon me, about living in Christ's righteousness, that means that that's been given to us. It's a huge, it's a huge change from what we were to what we are now. And it changes absolutely everything. And, and when you listen to or read the Sermon on the Mount, it is a, a really good idea to keep that theme in mind because it helps you apply all these things. It's not just random. Jesus was jumping from one thing to the next and talking about whatever came to mind. Um, it, it all hangs together. It all flows together. Case in point, he was talking to them about fasting and about not doing it because not doing it in order to gain the praise of others. Oh, I'm being so holy. Oh, watch me pray. Oh, watch me do without, you know, sacrificing to God, Wh whatever. We don't look for approval from the world. We don't look for approval from other people. And you know why? Because you already have the only approval that matters. I'm good with God. And, and, and again, he doesn't just love me. You know, we'll go back to, for God so loved the world, but he just puts up with me. That, that's the way we think. He doesn't just love us. He likes us. He cares about us. We are dear to him. When you see little baby whoever and who they are in their loving parents' eyes, that's who you are in your heavenly father's eyes. So I've got his approval because he's given me his righteousness. He, he there's nothing else that I can, there's nothing I can give him. That's not what it's about. He wants me to be happy. He wants me to be blessed. Why? Because I'm his dear child and he's given me everything I need. Have you ever stopped to think about that? You lack nothing. There is nothing this world can give you. There is nothing this world can take away because you have the only thing that matters. In, in, in the Gospel of Luke at Mary and Martha's house, Jesus calls it the one thing needful, right? And it won't be taken from you. We've got everything we need. So I don't need the approval of the world. I, I, don't, I don't need it. I'm not going to seek it because in order to seek the approval of the world, what do I have to do? I have to be like the world. I have to play by their rules because I, I, otherwise I'm not going to meet their approval. I'm not going to get it. I'm not going to gain it because if I gain the world's approval, that means I'm selling what I've got. I'm trading. I'm trading the blessings that I have in Christ, everything, for a bunch of junk that is nothing. So I don't want to seek the world's approval in like manner. I do not want to seek the treasures of this world. Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth. My, my treasure is not here. This isn't where it is. Anything here can and will be destroyed. Doesn't matter what it is. 
I've already got everything that I need. So we don't seek the treasures of this world because, and if there's anything the world shows us, it can't make you happy. It just doesn't work. It never works. You're chasing after the wrong thing. So Jesus then talks about the eye and what you're pursuing. If you're pursuing the right thing, the eye is the lamp of the body. But if you're setting your eye, if you're setting your heart by setting your eye on things that are the wrong thing, then it's going to be darkness. We turn light into darkness. And if that happens, it's it's a great, great darkness. You can't serve this world and serve him. Jesus said, my kingdom's not of this world. If it were, things would be different. The world hates me because I speak the truth. And the world is not about the truth. You know, they keep having this theme bounce through my head. We think we live in the information age. Well, nothing is as it appears. We don't live in the information age. We live in the disinformation age. Everything's a lie. Why? Because it is categorically opposed to the truth. It's categorically opposed to Jesus Christ. So he talks about not serving money. You can't serve two masters. You can't have it both ways. It's not the way it works. I can't serve the thing that Jesus saved me from and serve him. There's no way you can do that, right? You'll love the one, you'll hate the other. You'll be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money, wealth, material things. It doesn't work. So that's one view on wealth. Don't pursue it. Don't chase after it. Don't think that it's going to, to give you all kinds of things. And, and when Jesus talks about, when Jesus talks about um, wealth in the scriptures, we'll talk about what he where he always goes. And we'll get to that. I think I've got that in a note down here. Yep. Okay. So we'll just get going. So therefore, I tell you, therefore, really important thing. What does therefore always do? It points back to what happened before, what was laid out before. Anytime you see the word therefore, therefore, and it's many of you have heard me say it so many times, but it helps. When you see therefore, you have to go back to see what the therefore is there for. He's building on what preceded, okay? He's talked about not chasing after it and loving it, being money. And now he's talking about not worrying about it, not being anxious. And it's no small thing. It's no small thing that when Jesus is talking about money in the Sermon on the Mount here, it's a pretty good chunk. It, it, it's a fairly good part of the sermon. Why? Why is that? You know, and these are things to think about. Why does he devote so much time to this? You know, when you go through something that's very familiar, and the Sermon on the Mount is definitely very familiar. If I read part of it, you'll go, oh, yeah, I remember that, right? That means you have a hard time thinking about it because it is familiar. Back away from it and look at it different ways. Look at how what he spends time talking about. He could have talked about anything, and he could have done it very well. But he picked the things that he spoke about because they are important. They are important. You know, two things to remember. If there's a lot of it there, it must be important. And if it's weird and hard to understand, it's probably important. That stuff matters. But in this case, it's just sheer volume, how much time he spends talking about it. So he's moving on from chasing after it and loving it and pursuing it to talking about not worrying about it. Because when it comes to money, wealth, whatever you want to call it, you do one or the other. You tend to do one or the other. You're either chasing after it and pursuing it, lusting after it, desiring it, or you're worrying about it. How often do you keep your head on straight when it comes to money? You know what money is? 
I, I don't know how many of you out there have a toolbox or a utensil drawer. That's that's closer than going out in the garage. Go open the utensil drawer and pick up a potato masher or a ladle or whatever it might be. It's what is that thing? It's a tool. It's something that you need. When you mash potatoes, you need a potato masher. You need a spatula if you're getting stuff out of a bowl, a rubber spatula. Do you look at the rubber spatula and say, man, I love this spatula. I got to go back to Spatula City and buy another spatula because at Spatula City, they do spatulas and that's all. You know, and they've got a Christmas special. I got to go get more spatulas. I just love my spatula. No, neither do you worry about oh man, I hope I don't lose my spatula. What would happen if I lost my favorite Rubbermaid spatula? I don't know what I'd do. Life would be miserable. No, a spatula is just a tool. Just like a hammer is just a tool. All money is, is a tool. It's something to be used for a specific purpose. Just like clothes, they are to be used for a purpose, to keep you warm, to protect you, and hide your nakedness, right? Money is the same way. Food. What is food? It just keeps you alive. We don't want to fixate on it. It leads you all kinds of bad places. It's the same thing with money, but we have a problem with it. We don't think of it like a spatula or a hammer. And that's why when Jesus talks about money, he often talks about deceitfulness and it leading us astray. We'll get to that. Therefore, I tell you, do not be anxious. An emphatic statement, don't worry. Do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink or about your body. What will you put on? All of these things are bought with what? Money. We need to exchange things for these things. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Life. Life. Right there is the key in this whole thing. Jesus has come, John 10, 10. The thief comes only to kill, steal, and destroy. I have come that you may have life and have it to the full, to have it more abundantly, okay? Life. God wants us to be happy. He wants us to be content. He wants us to be blessed in serving him. Life itself is to be enjoyed appreciated as a gift from God. Is not life more than food? You don't need to worry about it. And the body more than clothing. Life is more than those things, isn't it? It's not just what you eat. It's not just how, what you wear. Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they. Perspective. Perspective. That's what Jesus is the greatest teacher ever. And he's teaching profound, important truths that we really struggle applying. And what does he do? He was outside. He was on the side of a hill, natural amphitheater there next to the sea. You could hear him from far, far, far away just by, because of the way the land was shaped there. And what did he do? He looked up in the air and pointed at birds. There were probably some flying around. Stuff that we can understand. Birds don't worry about all this stuff. God takes care of them. Are you not of more value than they? Perspective. If God takes care of them, he'll get to that. And which of you, by being anxious, worrying, fretting, which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to his span of life? And the answer is no one. Worry, in fact, does just the opposite. It's a stressor. It's not good for us. It has all kinds of negative physical effects on us. And why are you anxious, worrying, about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon, in all his glory, was not arrayed like one of these. And Solomon everybody knows was the richest person, right? Like in that so time. Solomon was rich. It's and and if you just it's it's a wonderful thing. Just Google passages about Solomon's wealth. 
He had people just bringing him loads of stuff. There was all kinds of gold, jewels, just beyond imagination what what Solomon had. And and why did Solomon get all that stuff? Because he didn't ask for it. When God asked him, what do you want? Because Solomon said, who am I to be king? I'm I'm a youth. I don't know anything. And, and, And God said, what do you want? And he said, give me wisdom. Give me wisdom that I might govern these people. And so God made him the wisest man who ever lived. And he said, because he didn't ask for it, I'm going to give you wealth as well. Um, And Solomon kind of ended up a train wreck, which is a lesson all on its own. But you can Google passages about Solomon's wealth, and it'll pull them up and just read the stuff that he had each day. That was brought in it. It was it was insane, and all these people knew very well how wealthy Solomon was, and and probably in real terms, he was way richer than anybody who's alive today. Just as far as real stuff, gold, silver, all, all that kind of stuff, just crazy wealth that Solomon had. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory, can you imagine how well Solomon could dress? He wasn't dressed like one of the lilies of the field, those beautiful, beautiful flowers. You know, if you you spend time looking at flowers, these beautiful things that God has created, it's amazing. It's amazing. And he does that for them. And what did they do? What work did they do? Did they fret? Did they toil? Did they spin? That means making cloth and all that kind of stuff. No. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is alive and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you? Oh, you of little faith. I love that phrase. And I'll say this as as I'm reading this. I do not know, especially, you know, different times in life, repeatedly going through financial struggles. How many times I've read this passage and it is the section. It is amazing how calming it is. Why? Because it's the word of God, but it's the word of God that speaks to us when we're anxious, when we're stressed. Because once we start thinking about money, our mind tends to run in the wrong direction, either one way or the other. One way is greed. The other is worry and and fret. But when Jesus, he's not scolding is he? He's not scolding. He's not berating them. What is it he says? Oh, you of little faith. It's it's encouragement. It's exhortation. It's spoken with love. He's telling us, you're thinking about this is all whacked out. It's all wrong. But he's so kind and so compassionate. There's such understanding as to our weakness in this. And it is our weakness. It's a weakness of faith because if I really understand who I am in God's eyes and why I'm here to serve him, then I'm not going to doubt that he's going to take care of me. And and I'm not going to chase after the stuff of this world. It just gets in the way. It just gets in the way and it turns my heart. Therefore, Therefore, again, based on all this stuff, he takes care of the birds, he clothes the grass, and they don't do anything to get it. Therefore, do not be anxious, saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? And he's saying this to people who got up every day and had to earn the money to buy their food, just like the people we knew in Peru. Don't be anxious saying, where are we going to get this stuff to take care of ourselves? For the Gentiles, the nations, the unbelievers, they seek after all these things. They chase after that stuff. They don't have me, and you do. The Gentiles seek after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. One thing that just popped up in my head, Dad, is yeah. right before this, he's talking about fasting. And, you know, just like not worrying in this part, not worrying about what you're going to eat and stuff like that. And that's kind of like, you know, just more encouragement to fast because, you know, that's one day where you're potentially saving money on food 
and you're also, you know, um, getting closer to God and just like kind of trusting him that, you know, he's going to provide food another day. And, And I think, you know, from a spiritual perspective, if you're going to fast, it's, it's swapping out one thing for the other, right? That time that I would spend eating or thinking about what I'm going to eat, I'm going to spend in prayer or in the word instead. And there's kind of a balance that way, right? Exactly. Like the days you fast, you really realize how much time you spend preparing food. Like you said, thinking about what you're going to eat and stuff like that. And it's just like, wow, there's so much more time in a day. You yeah. know, when you take at least one day out of the week per se, and you don't eat. Yep. And, and, and replace it with spending time in the word. So after all this stuff, and the Gentiles know the Gentiles want it, and your heavenly Father knows that you need it all. And what what's the message? He's going to take care of you. He's got you. Don't worry about it. Trust Him. And that doesn't mean there won't be times when things are tight. It doesn't certainly doesn't mean that there won't be times when, from a worldly standpoint, you're fairly destitute. But He's going to take care of you anyway. And, and, and when you do go through those times, he uses it for your good. You need to be asking yourself, what do I need to be learning from this? What, what, what insight am I gaining into the things that matter and the things that don't? Paul talks about, I've learned how to be content in all circumstances, whether abounding or in want, you know, whether full or hungry. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. It's perspective and trust and faith. Faith, important truth, faith is a very humble thing. It it starts with, I'm a poor, miserable sinner. I'm such a hot mess that God had to die to save me. So I need to just patiently be quiet and patiently learn. And, And where does he go? Where does he go? Kind of wrapping this wrapping this up. He's talked about pursuing stuff, worrying about stuff. But seek first, pursue, chase after, go after this, the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And his righteousness. His, his righteousness has been given to you through faith. Christ's righteousness has been imputed to you, credited to you to you and your account, but I want to walk in that. I want to live in that. I I want to see what all he has for me to do in that. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and and all these things will be added to you. I'm, I'm going to take care of all that stuff. That doesn't mean you're going to have a lot. It doesn't mean you're going to be wealthy, all of those things. And 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 here's newsflash. I don't want to be wealthy. I don't want to be wealthy. Why? Because I know it'll cause me problems. I I don't want to be wealthy, right? I I just want to be taken care of. You know, there's a place in the Psalms where it says, you know, don't give me too much. Give me enough. You know, unless I be, unless I be, don't give me too much, unless I be um, rich and and turn away from you and, and don't give me too little, unless I doubt you and curse you and, and lose my faith. Something something along those lines. Just take care of me. That, that, that's all I need. Whatever that looks like is okay. All these things will be added to you. Therefore, do not be anxious about tomorrow. For tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. I love that last line. I love the whole thing. But sufficient for the day is the trouble therein. That's the way it said in the King James. If I think about tomorrow, if I worry about tomorrow, I'm bringing a bunch of stuff I can do nothing about into today. And if I look back and fret over yesterday, I'm bringing that stuff into today. I need God's help just to deal with today and view it and understand it and walk in his service the way I ought to. So, Don't be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. I got enough to do 
today. I'm not going to worry. And again, worry is unbelief. Worry is saying God's not going to take care of me. Worry is doubting his promises where he makes it abundantly clear that he's always going to take care of us, no matter what. All right, we're going to stop there. Next time we'll go into chapter 7. And and if you did not get a chance to before, go listen to chapters 5 and 6 all together and think about that theme. This is about how we walk in the righteousness Christ has given us, how we live our faith and the way we see that it changes the way we look at everything. All righty, we're going to close there. That concludes our broadcast for today. We publish our videos on YouTube, BitChute, and Brideon. We hope you enjoyed this video, and if you did, please give us a like or a thumbs up. We invite you to subscribe so you can continue to receive our content. Also, please consider sharing this video with others. We love to hear from you, so please leave a comment below. This is Matthias 76, and together we will continue to decode the deception.